This is Friday night, September 30th, 2016. My name is Thomas Keegan, host of LibertarianProgressive.com, and we're also live at blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. And we've done uh, over 30 interviews so far this year of independent third-party candidates who are on the ballots um, and are going to be on the ballot this November 8th. And specifically, um, interesting enough, candidates that are the only independent or third-party option in their area. So uh, so we do um, have an interview tonight. It's with Gail Parker, and she's an independent for the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, running in District Number 1 in the great state of Virginia. You can see all the other interviews I've done this year at uh, LibertarianProgressive.com. And Gail, good evening, and uh, thank you for joining us today and telling us about your candidacy. And um, and so are you an independent or, I guess, an independent Green? And by the way, uh, before we hear from Gail, you can visit her website, Gail, G-A-I-L, Parker, dot U-S. And Gail, uh, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, uh, Thomas. Uh, it's nice of you to invite me on. Uh, and yes, I'm an independent, uh, and I'm a Green, so that makes me an independent Green uh, running in, in Virginia's uh, first congressional district. Okay, excellent. And um, is it now, has this, I don't think this is your first time running for office, is it? Uh, no, it is not, Thomas. This Actually, this makes the 12th consecutive year that I have been on the ballot uh, as an advocate for building rail, uh, more trains and less traffic is our, our uh, slogan. And uh, people will, uh, as you know, independent and third-party candidates have to collect signatures to get on the ballot. And in Virginia, uh, there's a fairly uh, high, um, I guess, requirement for signatures. Uh, it varies by the office. For U.S. House, it requires a thousand signatures, valid signatures, and we usually collect somewhere between um, 1,200 and 3,200 to get that 1,000 valid signatures. Uh, and we we find that people will stop in their tracks and sign a petition for more trains and less traffic. And the traffic in this area is just horrendous. But there are a lot of um, great reasons uh, why we advocate for building rail. And, in fact, I feel that I'm bringing uh, to uh, Virginians a way forward that leads to a bright, hopeful future for Virginia and for uh, the U.S. It's a future that offers us options for safer mobility, cleaner air, water our children and grandchildren can drink safely, uh, energy from the sun and the wind and jobs, lots of jobs and better health. I, I bring um, uh, to the citizens of Virginia a way forward that offers peace with honor, financial stability, and relentless pursuit of these American values. Uh, investments in rail and green energy make us healthier and make us money. Rail built anywhere in America benefits all of America. Uh, the solar age is here, and it's imperative that we get on board. And it's past time that we bring a, a green revolution to Virginia and to America. I'm asking Virginians to be courageous, uh, and we can prepare America for the future uh, by building rail and uh, renewable energy. And that, you know, that's kind of uh, what I'm about, Thomas. Thank you, Gail. And, and we're talking with Gail Parker, um, running for U.S. Congress in District 1. She's uh, an independent, um, some might call her an independent Green, but anyway, she's the only candidate besides a Republican or Democrat in her district. And Gail, we have some follow-up questions, and again, we do thank you for uh, being part of this interview today and being on the ballot so we can interview you. And uh, now this is a live show, so if anyone's calling in, uh, the call-in number is 602-753-1596. We'll wait till like the last five minutes of the interview if, if you have some time for uh, some call-ins. But uh, let me ask you, is, have you been in any debates so far? Are there any debates coming up, Gail? Uh, <clears throat> I was in an, a um, candidate's forum in a debate uh, just last night. Um, it was in Stafford, 
which is uh, one of the areas that's very interested in expanding and improving the rail service to the area. We had a very good debate. Uh, the incumbent was not there, and he has not participated in any of the events in District 1 um, so far this year. I believe there is one other debate coming up at Mary Washington University. I'm hoping to be invited and included in that debate. I have been in the past, and I fully expect to be included this time, except they've somehow missed uh, sending out the invitation. Uh, I do have another event on October the 12th, and um, I'm hoping that uh, the incumbent will be at that one as well. Sure, and let me just ask um, just a couple of follow-up questions about the debates, and then we'll uh, come back to the, your platform, um, which we do want to hear more about for sure. But the debates, uh, I think, is an issue almost in itself. I mean, you are on the ballot. You're not a write-in candidate. You're just as on the ballot as the other two candidates, right, Gail? That's correct. And the incumbent, um, I mean, I guess there's a, maybe he's stuck in traffic, so maybe he, he you know, the, the incumbent <laughs> needs the rail. But, I, I mean, um, I can, you know, if you miss one, but, I mean, there's three events, they should at least make one of them. But I wonder um, whose interest they think it's in not to come to the debates, theirs or the, uh, or the district's interests. Um, well, it's. It's certainly not in the voters' interest. Uh, in, in District 1 in Virginia, there are uh, roughly 2 million voters. It's a very large congressional district. There are only 11 uh, districts in Virginia. Uh, and uh, for a candidate not to attend the three events in his district, um, it's just unconscionable. Uh, and it, uh, it it's equally unconscionable and appalling, I believe, that the two presidential candidates uh, uh, for the uh, two minor parties, um, the Green Party and the Libertarian Party, uh, were not included in the national debates. And I'm hoping that the public will rise up and um, force the uh, Presidential Commission on Debates to open up those debates to uh, at least the, the four nationally recognized parties in Virginia. There, According to the CIA World Factbook, there are only four uh, national parties in the U.S., and it's entirely uh, reasonable that we should be able to expect to hear the debates and hear from all four candidates. Yes, and, um, and now I said at the uh, beginning we are interviewing especially independent third-party candidates who are on the ballot and the only independent or third-party candidate in that district. Um, so th this, these are unique interviews in that sense. And we're not endorsing anyone, though. The only thing that we're endorsing is a fair system. That's it. And let the best candidate win. Um, so, Gail, this, if you were to get elected um, this November 8th to represent District 1 in Virginia going into the U.S. House of Representatives, which I guess is lucky for you, it's not too far away, um, being, you're, being that you're in Virginia to the uh, Capitol, but um, this would not be the first time you've taken the oath to protect and defend the Constitution, um, is, is it? You have done that before in the past, right? Oh, that is correct. I served uh, 23, 24 years in the Air Force Reserves and uh, took the oath of office to protect and depend, defend uh, the U.S. Constitution from all enemies, uh, both foreign and domestic. So, yes, I'm familiar with that oath. Well, we do appreciate that very much, and um, and and maybe uh, the you know the district will uh, you know very seriously uh, consider you. I mean, there's 435 members in the U.S. House of Representatives, another 100 in the Senate. Right now, they're all Democrats and Republicans, and um, but they're are three people on the ballot this year, at least in your district. And so um, now you do, uh, we're talking again with Gail Parker, if you're just tuning in, independent for uh, Virginia in district number one. Uh, let me ask you, um, on your issues, on your website, Gail Parker, G-A-I-L Parker dot U-S, um, you do have some issues listed here. Um, there is uh, more candidates, less apathy. I think maybe that was kind of touched on a little bit. Fiscally conservative, socially responsible, an auditable accounting system at the Pentagon, 
uh, stop those no bid uncontested contract re- awards. I almost said rewards there, but awards. Um, mm-hmm pay off the, uh, well, now it's about $12 trillion, uh, I mean, $19 trillion federal debt, keep the economy vibrant with rail, adherence to the Arms Export Control Act, clean air, clean water, build rail now. You did mention solar a little bit earlier on as well. And um, so what about the, uh, you know, you said fiscally conservative, and you also mentioned paying off the national debt. Um, uh, You know, if you could Tell us and your potential district a little bit about that. And and if you don't mind telling us, what are some of the main cities in your district, too, by the way? Well, the main cities are Stafford, uh, Fredericksburg, uh, some the the, um, the courts redistricted District 1 and changed the boundaries. So uh, it cuts through Williamsburg and it goes all the way down to Pocosin, so it's a fairly large. It takes in King George County and uh, some of Spotsylvania County, uh, Stafford County. Uh, it's quite a large district. And uh, you, you're ex- are exactly correct, and um, what I have on the website, our website is under construction right now. We're redoing it to make it more um, mobile-friendly. Uh, the... Um, the debt uh, we have uh, uh, paying off the debt. Uh, people say, "Well, how are we going to do that?" Well, the way we do that is we have to count our money in uh, the Pentagon, which is one of the largest budgets in uh, the federal budget. Um, does not have an auditable accounting system, so we install an auditable accounting system so that we can count the money, and we stop those no bid, uncontested contracts. Studies have shown that just by uh, competing contracts, we can save about uh, 20%. Uh, so that is one way that we save the money and, and get um, and are able to build rail. And the thing about it, uh, rail will grow our economy. And when it grows our economy, uh, it automatically grows revenue. So it, it's sort of like a, a multiplier effect. So there are uh, actually uh, three things that I I am bringing and emphasizing to the voters in Virginia's District 1 this time. And the first is I want to make uh, mass transit, rail mass transit, the highest priority in our transportation budget. Uh, Right now there are policies that prevent it. And uh, so we need to level the playing field so that our municipal and state governments can solve their transportation issues with mass transit, more trains, and less traffic. It's better for our environment, and it's better for our health. Uh, The second thing I want to do is uh, I want to uh, bring more accountability to to the U.S. for arms sales, and this falls under support of the U.S. Constitution. And uh, it supports the Constitution because as arms sales that are not approved by the Congress, our elected officials in Congress, are illegal, and therefore we would we uh, as citizens uh, all across the U.S. Uh, have no one to lobby uh, it, uh, those for to prevent those sales if we disagree with them or if we disagree with what's being sold or um, to whom it's being sold. So that's a very fundamental protection of the Constitution, and I um, support uh, accountability so that we can, if we, we can hold our elected officials accountable for those sales. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean well, to break your train of thought there. No pun intended. Go <laughs> ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, no problem. I, I we've already mentioned the federal debt, and that's uh, the the next thing. Um, it's you know it's about our our tax dollars and our children and our grandchildren's future. Uh, so uh, the two legacy parties have uh, brought to us um, almost a twenty million uh, trillion dollar debt, and the interest payment on that debt alone, just the interest payment, uh, uh, varies from being the third largest expenditure to the sixth largest, depending on how you. You know, rack and stack uh, the 
the expenditures. But it's something to be very concerned about. And uh, by building rail and renewable energy, uh, renewable being solar, wind, and geothermal, we can grow the economy and create um, new eco jobs, cut dependence on foreign oil, balance the budget, and we can eventually pay off that federal debt. Uh, rail returns $25 to the community for every dollar invested. It's a proven technology, and rail is a plan. It's a, a positive solution uh, to to a lot of issues that we're facing uh, today. And the folks in District 1 uh, are well aware of the need for mass transit in this area. Uh, we're going to have about 1.6 million new jobs in Fairfax County, which is in northern Virginia, and the folks in my district commute uh, to this area every day. Uh, sometimes it's taking them two hours one way just to get to their jobs. So we really need mass transit um, and uh, new trains, new tracks, with more trains that run more often to more places in District 1. There's so many reasons why we need to promote rail. Sounds good. Actually, um, so this is what I'm getting from it. Um, it's, it sounds like a lot of infrastructure spending or investing, I should say. And when people say cuts in defense spending, um, some people that might trigger alarms for them. But I would say every penny that you spend getting us off our dependency in oil is defense spending. So you might be cutting it from some sales of guns and stuff to other countries, which, like you said, is a constitutional issue anyways. And that's kind of – I think that's another – investment of not giving potential enemies guns but um or guns that might you know flow into enemies uh and uh, so i mean if you spend it on solar you could call that energy spending i would just rather call it defense spending and um so what about solar i mean uh, you know there's lots of different kinds of energies there's nuclear there's wind there's geothermal um, solar, I find really interesting, uh, or, but feel free to expand on any of them. Um, if you could just take a minute to talk about uh, some of the um, getting us not as dependent on oil. I, I mean, then that's what Jimmy Carter tried to start to do, like about, what was that, 50 years ago or something like that, um, 45 years ago. You know, is it about time that we end our addiction to oil? Oh, definitely, definitely. By <clears throat> Excuse me. By ending our addiction to oil, it lessens our national security interest in those areas which are uh, right now they're prone uh, to uh, being a warring environment, and that war is so so expensive. We can, Thomas. We could in the United States, with the right emphasis, be 100 percent uh, renewable energy within 10 years. 100 percent within 10 years. Germany is well on their way uh, to being about 94, 95%. It's, that's their goal. Uh, and we can, we can do that same thing in the U.S. with the right emphasis. Uh, it's, we need to do it, and uh, it's, it's a better way. Uh, these, um, the fossil fuel industries I, I wish would wake up and realize that they're not in the fossil fuel industry. They're in the energy industry. And there is a new technology, a better way, a better ma mousetrap now. And that better mousetrap is solar energy, wind en energy, and geothermal energy. We need to, um, to put solar panels on all of our government buildings. We need uh, solar panels on our businesses. We need solar panels on our homes and our apartments. Uh, we have homes being built in Virginia that are called plus houses. They uh, create more energy than they consume, and they return the energy to uh, the grid. Uh, one homeowner that I know showed me his check. He made it five thousand uh, dollars in just in energy from his three-bedroom home. Uh, I think it was last year or year before last. It's amazing, uh, and the word is just not getting out enough. There's not enough um, 
uh, media attention given to it, and there's not enough emphasis placed on it by our elected officials on our government buildings. Uh, we should be much more uh, energy conscious and moving towards uh, 100% renewable energy. Yeah, we I mean, we it. had that big old sun in the sky. Let's, you know, might, might as well use it. And Germany, by the way, is not known for their sunshine. Um, but um, and imagine how many, how much more money people will have in their pockets if they had solar. Um, you know, that they could spend into the economy maybe as well. And um, so I, I do want to ask, in, in our national debt right now that you were talking about, yeah, it, it's maybe the third largest expenditure. That's also, keep in mind, with the almost uh, less than 1% interest rates. Um, and uh, so there was a, one question I had about the, the, the rail and uh, the rail system, um, which uh, might be a good idea for infrastructure and transportation and, and et cetera. But um, what about the issue of eminent domain? Uh, there'll be probably some people, potentially, hopefully not, but some people that could be affected by this. Do you think there should be some safeguards for people against eminent domain? Um, you know, are people getting paid enough for their homes if they do have eminent domain? Um, it, do you mind, ex you know, uh, what's your say on that? Well, that's a very good question, uh, Thomas, because w at one of the recent events I attended, uh, that exact question came up. Uh, and I would like to point out that right now we are trying to get 80 miles of new track built uh, from Alexandria all the way to Richmond, Virginia. Uh, this new track is needed because the it would serve our passenger rail service. We're asking that it be dedicated to passenger rail service. Uh, but the right-of-ways are owned by CSX and uh, the uh, Virginia Railway Express and the Amtrak trains use um, CSX's uh, uh, tracks. So if we had a third track, then our passenger uh, trains, which already have a 94 or 95% on-time rate, could be uh, on time more often, and there could be times when maintenance could be done on the tracks and they wouldn't have to stop the trains while they main in single track. They could keep two of them open. So there are a lot of really good valid reasons why we need new track. This track is planned to be located along existing railway right-of-ways. Now, it, we are uh, increasing the speed, higher speed, to 90 miles an hour. Uh, it's not the high-speed rail that we advocate for, trains as fast as planes, but it's a step in the right direction, and we believe uh, it's the right step. In some areas, uh, in one area, in Fredericksburg, there is a, a community that believes that that uh, their homes are going to be lost when the uh, rail lines are straightened out for this increased speed. And uh, I spoke with uh, some folks that were affected by that. Uh, and they're elderly, and they've lived in their homes all their life. They're probably paid for. Uh, and uh, it's they're very... Uh, unsettled at the prospect of moving. And what I suggested to them is something that I have seen done in Alexandria, Virginia. The city council decided to uh, renovate an entire city block. Uh, and they, innovate, they renovated not only one city block, but several city blocks. And they may have used the same practice at that time, but there were uh, affordable units in this city block. There were... 52, and uh, the surrounding communities objected very strenly, stren strenuously to um, this renovation. They said they liked their neighbors and they wanted to keep them there. Uh, but after a couple of years, uh, the city council won out and they did renovate and put uh, in luxury townhomes in that city block. But within the townhomes, nestled uh, in, in various areas and nooks and crannies, there were 52 affordable units in there. And some of the people who were displaced, some of the families that were displaced, moved back in. Not all did, but they, the city relocated them and uh, some found housing for them 
that was uh, adequate. But for those other uh, families, they moved back into new, beautiful homes in the same area that had, they had before. So my solution uh, to this um, lady that was concerned was that rather than negotiate a price for uh, their property, which and you can't really pr- place a um, a price on an elderly person having to move and relocate um, from a place they've lived all their life, I suggest that perhaps they negotiate a relocation package and that that might uh, solve two problems because I know that Fredericksburg is interested in renovating their areas and uh, they could build luxury homes and nestle in those uh, areas, affordable units, uh, or they could uh, relocate these elderly folks to uh, over 55 living areas, something that would be better for them and that they would be happier with and probably healthier than where they're living right now. And it would be a win-win situation for the city and for the residents that would be losing uh, the their homes where they live right now. So that's my suggestion. I believe that uh, their sacrifice, as I told the lady, would be for the greater good because we really, any, rail built anywhere in America benefits all of America. And there will be some cases that it just can't be helped, but uh, that property will have to be taken. And not everybody is um, opposed to the idea. We, I have heard people say, hey, you know, I, there's a rail possibility that rail may be coming through this area and my property will be affected, my home will be affected. If if I need to move, that's just it. I'll just tell me when I need to move and it, it'll be just fine. I'll I'll move. You can have the, the property. Well, I appreciate that. Let me just give, ask one follow-up question about that, and I just have a couple more questions here. Um, now, uh, you know, it's, I think it's a difference – to use eminent domain for something that's, you know, public versus, you know, something that like where a casino might go up or something where it's um, an individual's, although the city might make an argument that it's going to collect more sales tax. But um, but what about, um, are there any certain rights? Like if someone didn't want to go, I mean, if, it, if it's something that's that important, I mean, couldn't there be something that at least be considered that they be offered something like five or ten times the, va- the current market value because they might have bought it during an upswing, and right now housing prices are so depressed. So, I mean, if they got at least and, – and when you're talking about rail, you know, you're going to be investing billions. So paying for someone's home that's ten times more than that price is probably just going to be, you know, pennies – compared to the complete budget. I mean, would something like that be more fair, do you think, or do you think that's something to look into? Well, the the Constitution guarantees a fair price for property that the government takes. So there is a protection in the Constitution for uh, property uh, uh, that is required for the public good uh, of that nature. And uh, this the land, the price of the land is about 50% of the cost of putting in the rail. Uh, That's why we advocate for using existing right-of-ways. And uh, if the uh, rail uh, companies will not allow it or if the price is too high that they are asking, we recommend that we put the, the tracks right down the middle of the medians because we already own that land and that would make the the uh, rail much more affordable. And we cannot afford not to build the rail, uh, and it, but that would make it um, more palatable. Yeah, and I and I don't mean specifically about the rail. I mean if you do build where there's you know alongside existing tracks, that would be ideal most likely in in most situations. Just an overall issue about eminent domain for maybe other things. And I think you addressed it with a constant constitutional rights about getting a fair price i would i guess i'll just leave you with on that issue just maybe consider maybe people should get a little more than just a fair price i I would say on that but um you know if it's that important it probably you know might might be worth it but not not a big deal um so what about um 
Uh, so we've gone through a lot of different issues. I mean, it, the the rail and the um, energy policies uh, platform issues, you know, very much would affect our economy, I think. And um, uh, let me ask you, and, and I think you went through um, accountability and transparency and military spending. So what about the TPP um, or trade deals like that? Um, as you see it right now, because I know you probably haven't read the full TPP, but um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that's been in the news lately, do you think you would sign on to that as it is right now? Or And it's fair to say you don't know because you might you know, not know everything that's in it, too. Uh, right. Uh, I have uh, opposed the TPP on occasions because I do not know enough about that uh, bill. Um, I, 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 so I just re- really need to learn more about what it contains. Okay. And um, now, uh, w- what about trade with other countries? What would be an ideal trade? Um, you know, or do, should there be safeguards as far as the environment, uh, workers' rights? It, do you pretty much believe that we should be taxed this we should tax other countries imports the same amount as they tax ours you know or is trade pretty much good overall i mean the more countries we trade with the less we're at war with them um what do you think about trade in general as an overall policy well i think uh, in general trade uh is good because of the reason that you say uh and there are some uh arguments for specialization some Areas are uh, better t- suited to produce certain items, and they can produce them with uh, lower resources, uh, amount of resources than we can here. So uh, it, that would mean that those goods and services would be costing us less, uh, and therefore um, it should be good for everybody if we can get uh, our goods and services lower price and then we can produce something that uh, we can sell overseas and it would bring the world closer and make it um, less war war is uh, you know peace with honor and financial stability Um, capitalism needs peace in order to be able to thrive uh, whether it's in the U.S. or overseas. So it would benefit everybody uh, to uh, if we can get the whole world um, wrapped up in producing things to sell rather than uh, fighting wars with each other. It's, it would just be all the way around better. Okay, and let me ask you this. Should, um, I know this is looking in hindsight, but uh, was going into Iraq in 2000, you know, two, I think it was. Was that the right decision at that point, do you think? Well, I believe the right decision. Uh, you, people uh, in my group or in, in my circles have been advocating for building rail for as long as 30 years. And it, rail uh, uses energy so much more efficiently. It makes the war for oil and protecting the oil fields less important. So I believe that as far back as 30 years ago, the better alternative would be to uh, lessen the importance to the United States of fossil fuels. And we could we could have been doing that a long time ago by building rail. So there's an argument to be made that we might not even be in the Middle East if it, if, they, if there wasn't a lot of oil in the Middle East. Um, and I think that's a strong argument. Um, uh, there was what about um election any election reforms do you think um do you think you have you should have to um gather more signatures than your opponents or do you think everyone should have to gather the same amount of signatures and any other election um level playing field issues that you think be addressed well uh in the beginning i was really opposed to having to gather those signatures uh it's it's the major effort in an independence campaign is just uh, getting the signatures. And if it's a statewide campaign, then traveling all over the state to gather the signatures is, can be, be really a, 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 quite a chore. But I have learned so much by talking to the people, and they have taught me so much. They've taught me more 
about rail than I have learned from any books and why they uh, why they support building rail, why they won't want rail. Uh, and by traveling all over the state, I have learned which communities support it and, and what they their needs are. And uh, I and I've just had a really great time. And every time every year it gets more pleasurable because I go back and I see some of the same people. And it's just like uh, going back home. So uh, the um, collecting signatures in Virginia is is uh, a lot more difficult to get on the ballot than it is in some of the uh, states, but uh, it's uh, not it's not too big a, a wall to um, scale. Now, some of the states like uh, Pennsylvania and Texas, uh, maybe uh, North Carolina. The, their barriers for petition gathering are really onerous, and I believe that their signature levels should be lowered uh, quite a bit in those states. What about health care? Um, do you think the Affordable Care Act is good the way it is? Uh, should we make some changes? What do you say on that? Well, you know, uh, the good Lord has blessed me with uh, good ancestors with longevity, and uh, my myself and my family have not had too many experiences with the uh, current system of Affordable Care Act, so I don't have any personal experiences uh, to uh, gauge that by, except that um, the cost of insurance went up some whenever uh, we all signed up for that. Uh, I I um, am tending to favor, however, the single-payer system that the Green Party is putting uh, forward. There is a uh, candidate, uh, Dr. Margaret Flowers, who is running for U.S. Senate in Maryland, uh, and uh, Green Party candidate Dr. Jill Stein, uh, who have put forward some very specific um, uh, provisions for a single-payer act that promises to be um, less expensive and uh, provide better service. So uh, I am open to uh, those provisions and improving it, but we certainly do need to make sure that our our population, uh, the entire United States, has access to, as the name would imply, affordable health care. And there are some countries that offer uh you, you get a health care card and uh, if you when you need to go to the doctor you just go in and show me a card and so i i believe there are better ways to provide uh health care to everyone than what we have evolved to in the united states we have to be care- careful that we don't substitute um one tyranny for another when so uh, I believe there's a ways for improvement in our health care system. I, I saw a recent poll. I think it's um, 51% of people would uh, support, um, you know, Medicare for all at this point in time. Um, what about the minimum wage? Should the minimum wage be raised at all? Well, uh, we do advocate that an uh, affordable wage be paid, in, particularly in some of the high-cost areas, um, if yes, I would support it in some okay. areas. I'm not sure. I don't know if I would support it uh, across the board, and perhaps uh, as a um, states' rights issue. But um, I do believe that there are some areas that certainly do need to consider raising the minimum wage. And this okay. is and at one regard- area. Regarding states' rights, um, you know, Colorado, Washington, some other states have uh, legalized um, medicinal uh, marijuana or cannabis, however people want to say it. Um, do you so? Do you think is that a, should the federal government stay out of that, or what do you say? I I believe that those states uh, provide an excellent uh, experiment, and so we'll be watching how things turn out in those states very closely. Uh, I have had uh, uh, speakers on my show, uh, Green TV, uh, that do advocate for allowing the um, hemp, which is a cousin uh, to the cannabis. And um, it's it's uh, 
got a, a great uh, deal of good arguments for allowing it. So uh, I'm open to that. And do you think it should be, um, as far as criminal prosecution and people in, that aren't in those particular states should should be treated more as a health issue rather than a criminal issue, do you think? I do believe that we should uh, decriminalize it. Um, it's uh, we we uh, got to stop locking people up for things like that. Yeah, and and keep the jails, um, you know, ready for people that are committing, you know, murder and rape and stuff like that, and okay. uh, and violent crimes. Um, it, now. Uh, I have a final question here, but um, one thing you were, I just thought about is um, you were talking about uh, you want to kind of do some reform regarding no-bid contracts and, uh, you know, having more competition in the system, and that will save us money and have more integrity in the system. And that kind of reminds me of, um, you, you know, the incumbent who's refusing to debate you, uh, you, you know, um, they're... Uh, not, you know, they're not um, in favor of competition in this race, and they're kind of hoping that they get elected kind of like a no-bid contract in a sense, I would say. Um, but um, let me ask you the final question here. Ed, what, who are some of your favorite people, past or present, uh, elected or not, Gail? My favorite people? Oh, wow. Well, uh Angela Merkel is um, someone that I admire, and also uh, Margaret Thatcher. I thought they they were both uh, very um, competent women, and I, I admire them. And we need more women uh, in political office in the U.S. We need to have um, women that we can, uh, our young people can aspire to be like. Uh, we need a, a more women's influence uh, in our government. It's a sign of a civilized society that uh, can uh, work with women in leadership positions, I believe. But the thing about it is uh, that I feel that I bring to the voters in Virginia um, a, a way forward that is bright and hopeful future, and it's uh, it's a future that offers up safer mobility, cleaner air, water that our children and our grandchildren can drink safely, uh, energy from the sun and the wind, and jobs, lots of uh, jobs and new jobs, and better health. It's a it's a way forward that offers peace with honor, financial stability, and uh, and I. Uh, will relentlessly pursue those American values. We, if we invest in rail and, and green energy, it will make us healthier and it will make us money. Uh, rail built anywhere in America benefits all of America. Gail, we appreciate you taking the time. And um, again, folks, we've been, it's, someone had called in, but they dropped off the line. If, someone, if anyone has a question, they can make a quick if so if you want to call in, in the next 30 seconds here uh, we can try to fit in a question but if not that's okay too we've been talking with gail parker independent candidates for the u.s house of representatives district one she's going to be on the ballot this november 8 2016 giving people of her district um, another option besides uh, the incumbent the republican and the democrats uh, choices she's the only third party option in her area and we've been talking about uh, a lot of issues, a lot of consensus issues, everything from energy to foreign policy to inside uh, the capital as far as um, uh, no-bid contracts, the budgets, and many issues. If you do want to hear this interview again, it will be up in about 24 hours at libertarianprogressive.com, and you'll also find about 30-plus uh, other interviews at this point. Gail, we do thank you so much for your service already, and also hopefully, um, you know, good luck to you. Maybe uh, you'll be taking that oath again as a Congress member, and so thank you for your time. I hope you have a uh, wonderful weekend. It's Friday night for anyone listening here, and so any final words of wisdom, and again, we appreciate your time tonight. Uh, well, I would thank you so much, Thomas, for having me on. 
and the, the solar age is here. It's imperative that we all get on board. All right, and um, yeah, and and so get outside, get some vitamin D, and uh, let your solar panels do the same thing, right? So um, right. Well, good to talk with you today, and um, uh, take care, Gail. Thanks so much. We appreciate it.